Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is David Shear. I'm the Scholarly Communications and Research Curation Consultant with the Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. Uh, this is our last event for our Open Access Week events. Uh, this evening we'll be talking about open publishing and how it's been implemented and practiced here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we have a great panel as well as a wonderful moderator. I'm now going to turn it over to our moderator, who is the director of the Entertainment Technology Center's Press, Brad King. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so we're going to have a conversation today. So if you guys have questions while we're talking, don't wait to the end. You can have them, and if they come in, Please. we we may get we may get uh, some stuff from Twitter or online as well. So my name is Brad King. Um, I'm the editor and director of the ETC Press, which is one of two university presses here at Carnegie Mellon. Um, Drew will talk a little bit about that, I think, because he founded it. Um, and we're an open access publisher, so everything that we do um, is based in that, and we sort of move out from there. I came here, this is my first year, I've been working with Drew for about nine or ten years on the press, but uh, I just came here full time. Um, my background is actually as a technology writer, so I worked at Wired, I worked at MIT's Technology Review, and wrote a book that we were published um, through the ETC Press. So my background is sort of in this area of emerging platforms for publishing and things like that. In fact, I use some of these principles. I run a big writing collective in Indianapolis where I just moved from. We have about 400 people um, and we put out books and literary journals using open platforms as well. So this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. I'm going to introduce the panelists and I'm going to try to get this as right as I can and when I mess up, please correct me. Um, hopefully I'll get Drew right because I've known him the longest. So Dr. Drew Davidson is the director of the Entertainment Technology Center. Um, also the founder of the ETC Press, and he's written several books for us. Um, Cross Media Communication, I think, was the first one that I came across, and then most recently, Creative Chaos, which is about um, the design and teaching process that goes on down at the ETC. Um, he's done a lot of work around cross media and transmedia storytelling. Um, He's studied and helped create maker spaces in places like museums and libraries and science centers. Um, and did you found the Well Played Journal? Yes. Yes, and he's the founder of the Well Played Book Series too, as well, mm -hmm. um, which is an open uh, the Well Played Journal is an open access uh, journal about games and meaning. <laughs> right. uh, next to him is Dr. Don Caulfield. All right, did I get that right? Uh, Associate uh, Vice President for Facilities Management and Campus Services. Um, has a team of 350 people that I saw. Uh, <laughs> they coordinate things like university sustainability projects. He's an adjunct professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Got his PhD here and was a graduate of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and is one of the co-authors of Fundamentals of Infrastructure Management, which is a graduate level textbook. And there's another co-author up here as well. Um, now, Dr. Chris Henderson, uh, the Hammerschlag University Professor Emeritus. And I actually, as I saw your bio today, I went and looked at this. The Director of Traffic 21 Institute here at CMU, which is really awesome and cool. And I would love to do a panel just on that, but we will not do that today. <laughs> some fun stuff. <laughs> uh, Multidisciplinary Research Institute to design, test, and deploy technologies related to transportation communication, as far as I could tell, and lots of other stuff. The about was really long. Um, he's the editor-in-chief of the ASCE Journal of Transportation Engineering, and he co-authored the book, uh, Fundamentals of Infrastructure Management, and three other open access texts, um, as well as some traditional textbooks. So that's our panel, and I want to start by asking um, what drew you, each of you, to the open, because you came to open access in different ways, Drew sort of as a publisher and you guys as authors. So Drew, start with you, like why open access with the ETC Press? What was important about that for you? Uh, I think back when we were starting and I was talking to several colleagues, and this is probably a dozen years ago now, um, we were really interested in providing a forum that at the time we felt didn't exist around publishing for entertainment technologies and game, video games and games in particular. And as those discussions came up, something that came up repeatedly and I felt personally um, was the idea of having it be open access so that people could get, uh, it was more important to have that sort of impact and influence and have the word get out than worry about like royalties or money or locking it behind a paywall. And we are lucky to be in a car, you know, Carnegie Mellon. And it's a part of the conversations when we were pushing for 
the founding of the ETC Press was this idea of having being open access and not having to worry about, you know, within a university setting and necessarily having them run for a profit. Not that we want to sit there and burn through the dollars necessarily. We do think about budgets and all of that, but this idea of it was more important that uh, we wanted people to have the research and the writings available easily. And it's proven very successful in that regard. And I feel like, and then I want to talk from the author perspective, that there wasn't also, there wasn't many places where this kind of publishing around entertainment technology was really happening anyway. Mm -mm. So Not at the time. there wasn't a tremendous amount of competition between traditional and the open right, access. Yeah. Like that sort of gave us the ability to reach an audience. So as authors, how, what brought you guys to the world of open access publishing? Well, I, I guess I'll start. Do it. Since I did it earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I had a, a traditional textbook uh, called Project Management for Construction. Uh, it was published by Prentiss Hall, uh, and it had a stream of royalties and a stream of users over the years. Uh, but when we first did that book, my co-author was Tung Hao, uh, we asked for a re revision of the copyright uh, to the authors when the book went out of print. And uh, back then, books actually did go out of print because they had to do a, a specific print run. So I got the copyright back in the, in the mid-90s, and I decided to try something different, and that was to put the book up on the web for free open access. And it's been up now for close to two decades, and it gets a ton of use. Uh, I get emails on a regular basis from all over the world. I, I had one doctoral student who showed up here on campus and said, boy, I use this book in teaching classes for contractors in Africa. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's still, if you uh, Google project management for construction, it still comes up one of the first couple of hits that you get. And that was really an eye-opener to me about kind of the, the impact that you could have with open access. Um, subsequently, we, I did uh, three other books uh, and I'm starting to become more and more interested in getting uh, just technical articles up open access because, again, you can have much greater impact than you can under the traditional publishing routes for that kind of thing. By the way, um, if you try and get that reversion of copyright with publishers now, you can't do it. <laughs> uh, nowadays, you could do digital publishing for just a, a copy or two, and so most publishers will not allow you to, uh, to get that. So for the Fundamentals of Infrastructure Management book, we didn't even try. So when we did our book, because ours was in 2002, we actually negotiated in... You it, they had to sell a certain amount of digital copies. It wasn't just that they were available. And if they didn't sell that, the copyright would revert to us. So, like, that was the way we went about doing it. Okay. Not saying, yeah. like, that it, because all I got to do is put it up digitally and it still exists in print. And we said, if you're not selling them, that is effectively out of print for us. I've heard that is more difficult to do these days. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what, what brought you to that world? So, I'm a, a, not a relative novice, a complete novice <laughs> at this. Uh, but I, I, did, uh, I did my PhD here with Chris as my advisor uh, about 10 years ago. And so, uh, and f as we, we finished that in 2008, began teaching a class, a graduate level class here in uh, Fundamentals of Infrastructure Management and, um, and found there just were, there was no textbook available to treat the class the way that we wanted to treat it. And as we taught the class over a period of eight years, we did all of our, all of our texts were, were sort of uh, journal articles, news of the day, uh, what was going on on CNN or, or wherever. Um, and just sort of compiled a text uh, ad hoc, year over year. Uh, and then about 18 months ago, Chris uh, came up to me and said, hey, you know, why don't we should write a textbook. We've been looking for one for almost a decade. We haven't found one. Uh, we should write our own. And when we started that process, I didn't know any better than to do open access because that was that's how Chris had published all of his books. So we started looking at, so I'm like, well, you know, once a graduate student, always a graduate student, right? So, um, so I, I followed my advisor's uh, recommendation. I have not found that the way graduate students always be. Um, <laughs> but, but part of that process was then researching uh, open access licenses and what copyrights were available and how to... Uh, sort of how are we how are we going to copyright the book? Um, where would we, where are we going to list it? Where are we going to host it? How are we going to uh, sort of put it out there for for consumption? I went through this whole um, discovery process really with uh, Creative Commons and Kilt Hub 
um, and the online textbook libraries that has been really sort of eye-opening for me. So there's two, so I come from the world of professional writing, right? Like I, got, I made my living as a writer before I did this. And so one of the things that drew me to the ETC Press, and I think Drew and I sort of come at this a little bit differently, is the like you put in work to write something and impact is important and it's part of the tenure process, it's part of the academic process. But also I would like to get paid for that the work that I've done. And so we're working with models that sort of combined, it's the, it's the old sort of, you know, freemium that you get, you can get this for free, but you can also pay for it in different forms. Have you guys as authors thought about, like, is it only free? Like, do you <clears throat> offer it? Are, are there ways that people can buy the book if they want to, or is it straight free PDF? Straight. So, so at least for the Fundamentals of Infrastructure Management book, it's uh, share and share alike, mm -hmm. uh, free download. Um, we keep the instructor's manual uh, for instructors only, so you can't just the student can't just download the instructor's manual. But uh, <laughs> I know. So I probably yeah. could, there's Was probably that a learned. Or there's probably you... some money to be made there. I think probably, um, but but no, it's it's just strictly avail available for free download. So. Well, one one of the things I you sort of came to my mind. I remember when this panel came, I was like, I'm not going to have much to say, but I think I'm wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I actually worked in the publishing industry at Hold Reinhardt and Winston, which long while I was there, got acquired by Harcourt, which then I got acquired by Elsevier. So then I was like in the belly of the beast, um, and have published a couple other uh, publishing houses as well, and just looking at the contracts and working through those contracts. And kind of getting to your point about reversion, like some of those are locked tight, you can't get it ever back ever. <laughs> um, and uh, so, and part of like the impetus of the ETC press is like I've been on both sides where it felt like it was not a good experience for anybody involved. And so we're like, well, with ETC press, we want it to be good for the authors. We want to, you know, like they're, because as Brad was saying, you know, we want people to have not just impact, which we think is really important, and we could talk about. The variety of ways we're trying to measure that because back in the day when we started it we're like well let's just get it out there so we're having like we cut a relationship with acm digital library so our stuff goes in the acmdl um and there are a couple other websites out there that we're like oh we'll do we'll, we'll let them host it we'll let them host it and then once a pdf is free it's mm -hmm. kind of hard to track when other people start sharing it and um but that was one of the impetus is like how can we get into there and then we cut a deal we were actually doing research back in the entire with Creative Commons as well, mm -hmm. um, working directly because they're actually working on licenses, uh, you know, towards a variety. So we're like, hey, we'll sort of play test with you on licenses that our authors seemed interested in, um, and it sort of narrowed down to the share alike. And some people are really interested in actually letting people edit it. And we thought, oh, we could do digital text that people can edit on the fly, and that is still theoretically mm -hmm. been interesting. I remember we were also talking about we'll do media publishing. That'd be awesome. And people, and, uh, it drew more than me. I'm like, let's just do this one thing. Drew well, wants to play with all yeah. the different formats. Well, like 99 percent of our authors are like, no, we want to publish a book. Yeah. And so we also worked with Lulu.com to be somebody to help us towards getting something that there's a print copy in for a lot of our academics. And we are in the library. Uh, there's sort of like this. They, they like books. Well, um, let, me, mm -hmm. let me talk to your reward. Um, the project management for construction textbook was very successful as a commercial product. Got adopted a lot of places. I got a stream of royalty checks. But I would have been better off doing consulting rather than writing that book if I was only interested in monetary in money, return. Right. Absolutely no question about it. Yeah. And so uh, the, the <clears throat> motivation for doing it was really to have impact. We had a particular viewpoint in that book, the owner's viewpoint, and all the textbooks on the market at the time were all contractor-oriented. Same thing with the infrastructure management. Don and I had a particular viewpoint of people who would be practicing facilities management. And most of the textbooks that existed were either very narrow on one slice of infrastructure, or they were much more research-oriented mm -hmm. rather than practitioner-oriented. And I mean, at the end of the day, some of the open acts, I've taught some workshops on this and I always tell authors, if you're, if what you want to say is more important than having the book, that open access and the sort of self and indie publishing is always a better option because as soon as you get into the beast, there's going to be, you lose control over some of the way it's marketed and the editing and stuff. I know for us, so our book, the book that I wrote, um, I was pretty adamant that it, all of our books are for sale and anybody can go out and buy them and we price them at 
just above cost. Like it's not to, it's not necessarily as a money making venture, but it's to alter for multiple the, right. formats. Yeah, and to cover the basic cost. But we ended up selling. I think we did some. What, what was the what was the bundle? Humble bundle. Humble or? bundle. So because we used this system. Um, that allowed us to publish not just the PDF but the EPUB. We ended up selling five thousand copies of our book through this bundle, even though the free version of it was available. So I think some of the ETC press is about experimenting with distribution channels, yeah, and models and things like that. Um, but like, I'm curious, like for us too, and it's interesting to hear from an author. It's like impacts really interesting them, mm -hmm. like hearing that people are using it and understanding how they use it, so you could change it with something. That we find really inspiring when you hear people like, "Oh my God, we're downloading your stuff and using it in classes in how Africa." Do you, like, how do you, so? How do you go about? I know how we're sort of thinking about measuring impact, but how do you like as an author who did this or authors who did this? How do you measure what impact actually means outside of emails or things like that? Go ahead, Don. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, so I, I, I want to, I want to come back to the, I, I'll, I'll, I'll look at that, but I, had, I don't want to forget this other comment. So my other, I, I have a unique, maybe, I think it probably is unique perspective in that my primary role here is not as a, a fact, member of the faculty. Um, that's my probably my favorite role, but that's not that's not really what what uh, Andrew Carnegie expects me to do most of my day. Um, but but another part of my job is actually the uh, the university bookstore and university copy centers uh, are in a part of my portfolio, and those two groups manage. Obviously, the bookstore sells books, both uh, ebooks and uh, print books, and the copy centers actually produces does our our um, uh, copyright uh, certification. So if you're if you're trying to get copyright clearances for for a lecture or for you know the Harvard Press or whatever, that all runs through that um, through those operations. And so I learned a whole lot about this as I started the process of going through this through the book. I could I could have the the PDF file of my book turned into a hard copy book um, any sort of any time I want. And I think anyone who's who's working at a university has got a got an, a unit somewhere on campus that can take that hard copy book and print as many hard copies whether you want them spiral bound or whether you want them hard bound or however you want them uh, produced, they have those capabilities. We just sort of those two uh, operations are, are a bit disconnected, right? Um, so that, um, so that I just want to put that out there as, as uh, uh, Dave and I were talking earlier about, you know, first you, you know, 10 years ago you hosted a book like this on your website and it was hosted on the department server and there was a link to it on your website. And now, we're hosting it on Kilt Hub, and we're there are referatories out there uh, like the OTL that will will point towards it, and you can get a, a DOI for your book, and so yeah, now you have a durable uh, durable reference. The and now I can send that link to our print shop and have if I want if you know ten of my students want hard copy books because they want something they can take back with them when they go home, uh, we can make that happen too. So th this whole industry has changed in an incredibly short period of time. So back to your, um, to your impact question. For me, having people use the book, having downloads, having, its, uh, having citations, having it from a, so selfishly from a reputational standpoint, that's way more valuable to me than, than what the royalty stream might look like. And I only I say that in part with, with knowledge because talking to the manager of the bookstore, unless you're Unless you're sourcing large numbers of copies, um, you're starving to death on royalties on textbooks, right? That's not where the money is not going to be on. <laughs> so how, when you think about impact, when you think about, how do you think about measuring it? Oh, I, I would say there's a multiple ways of measuring. Downloads is a good, good one. Adoptions by other faculty, and you kind of hear about some of those, but not all of those. Community building. I mean, I'll mm -hmm. go to a conference and people <clears throat> talk about using books. Mm -hmm. Uh, and even things like uh, moving up in the Google search is an indicator of some sort of impact that you're having. But do you guys go out of your way to sort of measure what that is? Or is it just a thing that you sort of do informally because of the world that you're in? You sort of know what's happening with it. Yeah, I've been really bad at that. <laughs> so, for example, the project management for construction book, uh, I, I don't have statistics on how many downloads yeah. there have been. I think it depends on where you are in the process because this was my first book and it's only been out for like three months. 
I'm pretty obsessed about keeping track of whether or not people are using it. And when, when uh, you know, we, we know that uh, the University of Delaware, for instance, is using the book this semester. And so when you get it, when you find out about an adoption like that, um, I think it's really the, the reinforcement there is really quite powerful. So how do you think about it? Because this well, has been going on for like 12 years. I remember because we adjusted. Because I remember, like I was saying earlier, like we were like, let's get it out everywhere. And then it became really hard to, like, it'd take a lot of effort. Like, if an author reached out to me and go, well, how many downloads do I have? I'm like, all right, give me half a day to, like, dig around and look. And all the places yeah. I tried to seed it. All good intentions, and you know, sort of led me astray in that regard. It yeah. became hard to track. Because we have, like, 90-something publications that we put out now. So yeah, you right. imagine there's, like, 160 authors who get obsessed with their thing, <laughs> who want to know. And so it's difficult. I think one of the things we struggled with is, how do we measure what impact actually means? Right. So we started working with the library here around Kilt Hub and having a repository in the same way makes it a little easier to track and centralize just one place. And I mean, it used to be we would give the library a digital copy. We'd still host it to copy. So we were double dipping in a weird way. So now we're like, no, all digital copies will be at the library. Point to there. It has a DOI. ACMDL is actually going to link to our, since it has DOIs and it has that durable link, they'll actually link to ours so it won't split there either um, and that we feel like that's going to give us more control and at least be able to measure it in some way since we get so many requests to mm -hmm. ask is and sometimes you know it's like oh god a lot i don't know yeah or n not any like we, yeah. it's, it's sort of unclear and this is sort of one of the problems i think with um there's a few problems with open access um and small publishing and one of it is i think it's it's a good like i we, the joke we make when i was covering technology at Wired was we said technology is going to change and democratize everything and then you jump to 2017 and you're like oh crap it democratized everything right <laughs> and like now we don't know what's happening um, and open access is the same way like you can control your copyright and you can say it has impact but actually understanding the impact is one of the things that traditional publishing did pretty well was to tell you the reach of where things were um, and what kind of impact you were having so as you guys sat down to um, to do this, the benefit for you was being able to say what you wanted to say. Was that? Do you think that was the biggest? Sure, and that, mm -hmm. and I think Don's point about reputation is is well taken. And that wouldn't have been served through a traditional publishing route, you don't think, or was it? Wouldn't or traditional publishers didn't offer you guys what you needed? I think uh, we're getting a lot more use out of the open access books than in anything out of a traditional publisher. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, you think about what's the market for the kind of book mm -hmm. you have, too. You know, so a big publisher isn't going to want to, they don't see a revenue stream there. It'd be harder, they either want you to expand the scope of the book or to do something else that's going to kind of, right. in their view, increase its sales. This, this isn't an AP physics book. Right, yeah. that's going right. to get, right. <laughs> Every high school's going to get Right, right. <laughs> right. You know, they, they, they want Chris's old book, the one for the Prentice Hall one, you know, where you, it was easily adopted as a textbook and they could project what that would be. But now everything's up in the air and the ability to customize something either by use, taking a narrow focus but going deep into it is a real value. To, to mm -hmm. And that allows you to customize that way. Something I was curious about actually, because I've looked at lots of different e self we used to, in the libraries used to talk about vanity presses, and you know what those were. Somebody say, "Gee, I've got, I want to have this book," and they pay, you pay somebody to publish it for you. You know, so you got what you paid for. Hmm. But in this environment, how do you keep the quality at the kind of level you really desire? People can be good writers, but you always need editors. Well, editors cost money, so when you're doing a book, how do you address sort of that editorial? So, and before you answer, there's a, this is, this is my eternal fight with librarians because vanity, <laughs> vanity presses are different than small presses are different from oh, independent absolutely. presses, absolutely. right? And so all self-publishing isn't necessarily, or I all, vanity presses right, I meant vanity. right. But it's a lot of times those things get lumped together <laughs> yeah. and people say independent presses, we sort of call what we, or at least I call it professionalized amateurism, right? Like we're like, I'm a professional editor. Like I work, like that's that's what I did. I made my career out of and that. And so when we work at the ETC Press, there's an a professional editorial layer, 
Yeah. We have an advisory board that goes through stuff. Right. We have a professional designer. So for us, I we think have review boards. we have review mm -hmm. boards. Like there is a level that is sort of there that's easier for the ETC press than maybe for individual authors. So I think to like, how did you guys work on your book? Well, I can for the Prentice Hall book, we we had that layer of editing. Yeah. I can tell you the best editing I had was getting emails from people who were using the book. Uh, <laughs> it, they would tell you exactly stuff that isn't clear, that's ambiguous, there are typos, and I got a lot more uh, useful feedback from people who were using the book than I did from the Prentice All editorial staff. And you would make edits and then just I, update the PDF sort exactly. of as you go. Yep, I'd do it once yeah, a year. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and... Um, for the infrastructure management book, we essentially uh, took advantage of professional colleagues to, to do a review, and we're expecting to get <laughs> comments advantage. from students. Too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we did. Um, I also used the book in draft um, last spring, so so we had had the book ready, sort of ready, right? Um, <laughs> And then used it in draft to teach the class last spring and then took feedback from that group of students and from having sort of been through the text end to end as a part of the course program to do, I uh, spent a lot of time over the summer uh, making edits and revisions. And Dave and I are working through sort of a revision to, the, to edition number one now to, to address what I think is probably the biggest, the biggest gap that I noticed personally between uh, sort of what we did and what you see sort of on the bookshelf in a bookstore is are, are quality issues related to like things like images. Uh, so the resolution of a particular image, you know, you might grab an image from, because again, we're trying to work from in an open access environment. So you have uh, wiki commons and other sort of, you have sort of common access sort of sources and the resolution of that image may not be what you want really if you were trying to do a publication quality um, but you reach a point where you're going to say, you know what, that image just says what I want to say or illustrates what I want to illustrate, and it's good enough. Um, and you do, to a certain extent, get what you pay for. So a free download book may not have every nuance that a book that you pay $150 for is going to have. I, I looked at your book, actually, to just because I was thinking about what are the illustrations mm -hmm. in there. And I could see that you picked a lot of open access or government resources, to, you know, which would be free to put that in there. Was that it? Was that an easy thing to do, or would you, did you wish you could have captured something that was from, what is it, the American Society of Civil Engineers? Yep. Did they ever have something you want to put in, but you would have had to pay for it? It, it was a ton of work to do. Well, I, I think it would have been impossible. Enough, yeah. I, I, think, I think it would have probably been impossible. Um, five years ago, I, we would have had to, the images that we wanted to use, we'd have had to create. You know, it would have been source author, source author. And there's a lot of that in there that we took our, a lot of our own photographs. Or we did a lot of our own figures and graphs. Um, but the, the, the numbers of resources that are available now to, to, do, to do open source um, are really have changed significantly. And it, as Dave knows, we, I went back through the book in, in uh, September and October and, and went back through and changed probably another 40 or 50 images that I thought were not clean enough um, or as clean as I would have liked them to be, uh, to and to because I do want it l widely listed and I want it uh, readily available, and so we're trying to make it as clean as we can. But it was yes, it's a, it's a it's a pretty big lift. Yeah. It, go ahead, go. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We had to take out figures that we would have liked to have had, but <laughs> just couldn't do it. <laughs> I know. Again, so at the collective, not at the ETC press, but like we actually hire designers mm -hmm. um, to to go do stuff. That we that because it's you need the cover to look good and you need your images to look good. Like we can edit, but we can't make anything, and that does cost. It doesn't cost a lot, but it does cost something. And if you have a textbook, ours are I think different. They're not meant to be textbooks, um, but I imagine you could get into a pretty substantial amount of cost as you begin to try to make graphs and designs and things like that. We don't really do it at the ETC Press. That's not we put the impetus on the authors. Like that's not oh, yeah. In terms of image, yeah. yeah. I mean, like in building on your question, that was like from the outset. We were, I didn't want it to become like Drew's press, you know, where I, everything I say goes. Um, so we were like setting up a board that had like CMU people on it, 
and also external colleagues and authors, you know, various levels of reputation, you know, being very careful and strategic about looking for people um, within the field um, to, to help us, one, with our reputation, but also with our rigor. Um, and I think that's been very successful in terms of helping us guide the vision of the press and getting that type of feedback and that type of input um, and setting up processes that initially was sort of like, I do everything. <laughs> Um, and then it became like, well, no, here's what we do in a book. Like, and Brad, just when he started getting involved, pre even hiring, was probably the most engaged volunteer editor that we had. Um, and so I started thinking about, well, here's what we're going to do to create an author packet that helps them understand our process because we are a little unique and different in the way we do it because part of our open access publishing philosophy is we're also, we templatize a lot of our design to help us work within a smaller sort of, makes us more agile so we can get things out more quickly which was a big impetus for a lot of, um, unlike infrastructure, which I think could be timeless in some ways as you guys update it. We have yeah. some people like, we want to do a textbook on teaching with mobile. And the iPhone just came out. Damn it. You know, that actually happened yeah, to yeah. one of our authors. Um, yeah. And so they were talking about the Palm Pilot, if you all remember. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the I-705 <laughs> was the greatest <laughs> And so like they, they needed to make a quick pivot and change to keep it. And so a lot of people come to us because we can get things out quickly. And there's something, particularly when you're talking technology, if you want to try to write write a textbook or some sort of academic something that you want to have it in a timely manner, having that sort of templatized, but it, with a rigor and a review process around it as well, we can get things out pretty quick. I mean, when I get a book, we can use that. We use press books. We use a template. We can have it for sale in Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, like in about four hours. Like, and have it out and designed. Um, that's the digital lane. Like, there's the pre-process of them. Right yeah, that. Here. However long it takes to make it. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, so one of the things uh, that I want to talk about, be Drew, with you, is why we have both paid versions and books that you can go pay money for in these free versions as well. Like, this is a question that I get asked all the time. Don't you have? No, I do, but I, nobody wants. Nobody cares about what I have to say. No, my idea at the time was like this experiment of trying to do multimodal publishing, and see if they referenced each other, and sometimes if there was some sort of uh, synergy between them two. And again, I was like, oh, we'll play with a lot, and some of the digital stuff can be interactive and updated, and we can have videos embedded, and the print book would be great. And what it really turned out in the law. So the experiment that was my hope. Um, and some people still reach out, like Jen reached out to a colleague of Brad's, reached out going, I want to do this interactive textbook around physics, so there's going to be videos that will highlight the concepts I'm talking about. Whereas uh, mostly people wanted something about a physical copy of a book means they've published. Mm -hmm. um, and we've noticed, I think historically, as we could track our sales, uh, it's, not, it's not bad for like a small academic, like most of our copies spell 200 to 500 sales. But then you can times 10 to times 10,000 in terms of downloads. Um, and so like the well played, the first well played book, last time I was tracking it really carefully when I was sort of obsessing about it, it was up to like 500,000 downloads. And we're like, we're on to something with this idea. Of sort of like, it was like critical close readings of video games. By the way, the National Academies Press has the same model. They'll yeah. do digital mm -hmm. downloads for free and print yeah. copies mm -hmm. cost. Yeah. And we always said like the less design you had, the freer it would be. So originally our books you download as text files. Now it's a PDF and if you wanted the digital book that cost a small amount and if you wanted the physical book that cost a little more but we were sort of experimenting on that yeah. that line. Yeah, I was just going to say the net with how you pay the National Academy they always ask you why you're using it. If you <laughs> want to share that information. So they're trying to sort of Gather the same data. gathering information. You, information. Anyone is is like, why are you doing this? The thing? impact, right? What are you mm -hmm. do yeah. And of course, you, I, my cynicism is, we you know. Well, we, people download a lot of stuff. I can tell you, millions of things see in downloads. Do we really know if people read them? How do right. they use them? I mean, so I, there's a certain. It's just like checking out a book. You don't know what happens when people take it home with them or whatever. So your comment, Chris, about you know having people or, or, or non people write to you about it or say they're adopting it, that's actually kind of a nice kind of thing to do because that gives you a different kind of qualitative sense about how what sort of impact it might really have in a meaningful way. We were joking with David, pre Killed Hub, our 
we use Google Analytics, so a, a mm -hmm. download was really just the file had been touched. Mm -hmm. it, you know, um, we, we have no idea if they really even downloaded it. It was just somebody clicked on that link. Yeah. 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 And there's at least with Kill, Kill Hub, we can track that. It, no, it was downloaded. <laughs> Um, I was just, you touched on it briefly, but I wanted to see if you could talk a little about the interactivity yeah. and, and if you, how you've done that, or if it's been successful, or if you need to do more. <laughs> I mean, it's still sitting in there as part of our philosophy of like we were interested, but um, it takes more effort. And then, and again, we kind of lean on the author. If they're like, we're not somebody who's like, oh, yes, we will make that game for you. Um, we've actually talked about publishing games because of, you know, we published a board game. Um, is one of our uh, tied in with the textbook or one of our books we were writing, um, and so that was an interesting exercise. So we're like we're part of it's like we're interested in playing around that. And one of our books that it, and it didn't prove true. Like at the time, Lulu was uh, Lulu was young when we started, and they actually had we had a direct sales rep in there. They actually added features for us. Um, we were one of the first users of Lulu that like yeah, I don't know if anybody's used something like they allow us to like. If we all wanted to write a book, I can make sure that I put us all in there as authors, and you'd have accounts, you'd be able to log in. And that was at first it was just like one person, one account, one book. And now I can hold a, a and I was trying to convince them into what if because I've heard from colleagues like they like using our sort of portfolio, but they use this chapter here, this chapter here, and this chapter here. Um, they're like, is there any way we could have a, help them shuffle together the chapters they're grabbing into one? And Lulu was like, oh, we're interested, and then. And then they blew up, like and it all blew up. Back then. <laughs> yeah. And like so, they they're like, "That's a pain in the butt." No, sorry, because um, they really try to automate everything. Um, like when we try, some some of our authors come to us and they struggle with the images because black and white is four cents a page, mm -hmm. color is forty cents a page. <clears throat> they're like, yeah, but I only want one color image. I'm like, they're gonna run the whole book the through whole the book. printer because yeah. yeah. nobody touches that book. So every page is going through the color printer. So times forty, you know, <laughs> in terms of cost. So we keep talking about it, but like so far it hasn't happened. I'm open to talking about like and we've heard ideas, but yeah. the authors tend to drop the ball. You you mentioned the the editing services that traditional publishers provide, and, well, and I think there are substitutes. Yes, used <laughs> yeah. to provide. One thing that I do miss out of the traditional from the traditional publishers was their marketing yes. mm -hmm. activity. And mm -hmm. you're on your own with an open access mm -hmm. book. Um, and it used to be there would be publishers reps who would come and visit mm -hmm. uh, departments and push their books and that sort of thing. So uh, that doesn't exist for open access. And we, it doesn't for us. For that, like, it's us. Yeah. And grassroots and social media. And we're really honest about that. And then somebody goes, so I want to do a print run of posters. Like, no, 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 we don't do that. Yeah. I hope you have money and can <laughs> make the poster. <laughs> um, one of the things about, particularly about multimedia, which we haven't done, but largely because the authors would have to come up with that, is when we use press books, we can actually make digital books with embedded videos in them. Like, you don't want to make a digital book that has the video in it because the download will be gigantic and nobody will ever do it. But it really is just a matter of an author being able to create or find videos that are open. Like, we can do that, um, and then you, we could make them as interactive <coughs> PDFs, and we can make them as um, digital books that are EPUBs, Kindle files. Like, we can actually do it as an export of... WordPress, um, X, H, X, HTML, so that they can embed it on their site. It's just a matter of them coming to us. So it's not that we can't. It's that most folks aren't thinking about books in that way. Like, um, there's it's a guy weird. Like the just the having that forum. Like 99% of people just want books, which we're fine and happy to do. But I thought we were gonna be like, you can do media. Well, like, especially for what you, you're, you're <laughs> right, yeah. writing. Yeah. I mean, this is a discussion that we have. Like, we should have games embedded in the things that when people are doing games. But and we're just, we've been with a digital humanities group here, Carnegie email, and we've been talking with them a bit more about ways we could do some different stuff and even some visualizations. And Brad's brought some ideas of like different exploring, not just books. Like, what if we do podcasts? What if we do short video series? What if we do this and different ways to stitch it together? So that there's you know talk about reputation building and just different ways to get the word out and again get the ideas out and do short little singles that you can get out quickly and. So we're, we're very open to format so exploration. getting the textbook notice, I mean, there's kind of like, there's a lot of little things that are going on that there are a lot of little streams. Like New York State has mandated that the, the state system look to create open textbooks, and they have a program called Open NYS, Open you know, NES. 
<laughs> nice. Yeah. Bryce has a textbook problem program called OpenStax, yep. and you go around, Michigan and what has happens one. is yeah. there's a lot of different things that are going on, and I think that kind of can, could obscure um, some of the things that that aren't sh that might not show up as readily. But there is the Open Educational Resource Group at SPARC that's trying to bring these together, and then Minnesota's Open Textbook Network or Library, I can't remember which one, where people are trying to put things in there to foster adoption of open textbooks. And it, prior to hiring Brad, part of like the the range of conferences I attend meant I wasn't going to a lot of open access things because it wasn't necessarily like, it's like, yay, let me squeeze another conference into my life. It was hard to, to stomach. <laughs> well, and it, I mean, even that, even with those groups out there, it still puts the impetus on us for right. authors i mean it's a little bit easier for i think the etc press because we have some people power to at least go explore and it's i think probably harder for well and it's not like at least in my case it's not like that's my natural skill set right is right. you know um marketing and advertising and you know i'm just like everyone else at carnegie Mellon, i'm an introvert and would prefer to <laughs> <laughs> um, speak for yourself <laughs> right yeah everyone not at the etc okay uh, <laughs> uh, uh, that's why they made me yeah. moderate this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's i mean part of what we're doing i think is trying to to work with cmu so not only with the library but also with the marketing and communication department and looking at different ways that we can take the books that we make and shoot minute long videos that talk about what's going like things that can be distributed out in social spaces so that um, and then using our advisory board as a way to sort of amplify that out which again is easier for the press and probably a little bit harder for individual authors um, to go do so talk to me about from a teaching perspective um, since we've sort of talked a little bit high level um, are, what kind of benefits do, do your students get from the open access publishing from what you guys are doing? Well, certainly there's a obvious, pretty obvious financial benefit. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, I think the other couple of things that I've, I mean, I've only used the book once, um, but I can also sort of reflect back on my own experience as a student. They're more likely to get the book, right? If the, if the textbook's 100 bucks or 150 bucks or 200 bucks, uh, they're more likely to borrow it from a friend or copy the chapter that they need or, um, so they're more likely to actually have the textbook in their hands when the time comes to use it. The other thing is that, you know, Chris and I's approach to this course, as he said, was is quite a bit different than sort of the traditional approach is, well, we're going to teach infrastructure management. It's going to be all about roads all the time. That, and and uh, our perspective was much broader than that. Um, and so we're able to design a course, design a text to around a course the way we believe it should have been taught. Um, and so it's a very customized approach. The last piece I would say is there's a difference in the interaction between the professor and the student when the student knows the professor wrote the book. Uh, from their point of view, literally, right, it quotes, the prof my professor wrote the book. There's a, there's a presumption of competence there that may be undeserved, but you get it anyway. Um, I wrote it. Because <laughs> um, you wrote it, yeah. You talked a little bit about it being um, edited by colleagues and stuff in the field. Like, were you getting feedback, like... The first time you presented it, had students seen it before that, or had it stayed at a high level with colleagues editing it before students saw it? In other words, how much interaction went back and forth with the ways in which the text was developed? Well, the, the same text that Don used in the classroom got sent out to our colleagues mm -hmm. for comments. So you were getting both were getting from students and, and, and from colleagues. What kind and of now I'm expecting to get a whole mm -hmm. flock of emails on the, on the topic, too. <laughs> Well, like, for instance, one, uh, so we sort of did an informal peer review. We know who our peers are that are working in this, in this space, sent it out to them, and, and in a couple of cases said, you know, you have a whole chapter, you're missing a whole chapter on, on X. And so we went back and we looked at the book, and like, you're right, it really is, it really falls short of where it needs to be without this content in it. And so we inserted, it wasn't, it ended up not being a whole chapter, but it was a half a chapter addition, additional material and content that we had just, not not seen the need to incorporate because we're doing it a different way, um, and then I already know from from faculty that are using it now that they're accumulating comments for me. I told them to <laughs> to send them all in. I'd rather have them one at a time than than uh, than get a three page book. But we know there are edits, there are typos, there are 
areas that were unclear or, you know, example problems that really didn't work that we thought would work, but when they tried to use them in class, they didn't. So I think this, this first, um, this first year of using the book will really provide us with a lot of feedback. Can I, can I ask you a question? Those of you who've done a, a textbook, when students get it, what, what have you, what are your observations about how they, how they, since it's free, what have they done with it? In, in two ways. There are these surveys where people will say and students will attest, oh, I'd rather read it in paper. They love the, the open access book because it's free. But I also know that a lot of people would turn around and print it out so they can do stuff with it. So number one, is that what they're doing? And have you observed if they're doing it all in E? How is it that they're using it? Do you have any observations on how they in, engage with the material? Well, you we said if they're have using a student it. who's been using books <laughs> right there, <laughs> Julie. <laughs> so you can address that one. <laughs> so when I was a student, when I was in class, I wasn't using textbook, but I was a TA for that yeah. um, um, class for four, five years, well, four years, yeah. four different semesters. Um, and then I, my, based on my observation, the students print them out. They do print them out. And then they come to my office hour with one chapter, like a couple pages, and then pointing out, this is the part I don't understand, and then this is the part like, you want to explain more, or something like that. And then they actually give feedbacks so, like, um, that is very useful um, for Scott Matthews, who is a, um, <laughs> and then Chris, um, they're the co-authors of the book, textbook called Life Cycle Assessment. Um, so the student come back with, uh, with some comments, like, oh, this is probably wrong, you might check it out. And we actually correct something. Um, from their comments. And then this, uh, what, what's the second part of the question? Oh, well, if they were only reading it in E, how did it, oh, this is kind of way What is E? In, electronic, in e? electronic. Oh, electronic. electronic. Sorry. I was like, my, my, is this a Carnegie Mellon thing? I don't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's yeah, yeah, just got got computing like, language you just know, know, right? But how did they if, they, if they were actually reading it as an E textbook without printing it out, what did they do in terms of kind of engaging with it? You know, like when you're in paper, you make notes, you highlight it. Are, are students applying sort of t uh, tools to kind of uh, take greater advantage of that kind of connection to learning? Because it's one thing to read, but it's another thing to learn. So I will say, when I taught, I only used digital books. I only used books that were, that were in digital forms. One of the reasons I like the ETC Press. Um, I would make my notes. I would make all my notes in the book and then so that kids could access what notes I thought were important about the books, like as they were reading it. And then we would aggregate the stuff that they brought together that they thought were interesting, and I'd add those to the digital text. So there was the, the te way of teaching. I mean, it's the same way of teaching. It's just using digital stuff, but teaching them how those tools work. Like we expect students to understand that, and I thought it was more important to teach them. You can highlight, make notes, share it collaboratively in ways that you can't if it's paper, because that's just yours. But that digital format allows you to sort of read in person. So that's different than what they did, but like I think there are ways to do that. Um, how, how difficult was it to write a book in public, right? Because you're writing it, people are seeing drafts, students are using it, you know there's problems with it. Like this is a different way to think about writing a book. Yeah. Well, uh, as Julie was saying, it was really useful to get feedback. I feel sorry, I feel sorry for the kids going through the first version of this, but you know, uh, we thought it was better than what was out there as alternatives. So you didn't have a problem sort of, you didn't feel that you were undermining your authority by having something written that wasn't done and complete? I don't, I don't think it ever even occurred to me. Um, <laughs> uh, and maybe, maybe it was just my, uh, so I, I, I did my master's at Illinois. Uh, and while I was there, I think almost more than half of my classes were taught out of textbooks that were in draft that my professors were writing. Um, that was just a function of that place. And I just thought it was the coolest thing ever. So the fact that I was getting a chance to do it myself, I just was sort of picked up on that experience. And then one thing to add, like Scott always is like, oh, I can know um, who are really paying attention to the class. <laughs> 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 you see that channel. I did the environmental life cycle yeah, assessment for I just remember I'm a just totally bless myself doing my uh, 
master's thesis way back at University of North Carolina where you had to do it like on a what, 100% cotton paper and all that rigmarole. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Do back in the day. And, you know, then it was just going to go in the library. So I put in there on some page, you know, if you are reading this, please email me at. And I've never gotten an email. <laughs> in the copy that's sitting somewhere in that library. But it's maybe on digitally, really nice paper. Yeah, it's on really good paper. <laughs> but I was just curious, and I was like a punk at the time. I guess I still am. I don't know. Like, I'm building on one of the things I've heard from colleagues with our books is they like to buy the book and have several copies, and they get all the students that have the digital version, and they go through it chapter by chapter, and they've noticed that some of them print them out, and some of them do sort of like what Brad does, and they use the digital version to share in some way so they can see like a little palimpsest of the class commentary around a digital version in ways that they find powerful. But that, that's what's so inspiring to me is when you hear about how they're using it, and you're like, oh, it's worth doing open access because people use it more. Um, and that was being, like, and we felt lucky. And I feel the charge, and this is what I put, I remember when I was talking to Mark Camlet and Cohen at the time, the president and the provost at the time, going, here's my idea, and here's why I think it should be open access, because I believe it's a un within the university's charter to be somebody who shares information with the world. And, you know, how are you going to say no to that? Because um, <laughs> So, like, we made this case, of, like, we're going to try to run as close to the black as we can, but we're not about trying to make money. We're about trying to ha have an impact and show that and steer conversations in ways that we feel feel like Carnegie Mellon's uniquely positioned because of this university to be the leader in that. And we can drive those costs way down using emerging technologies. So yeah. what a traditional press would lose, you know, seven figures trying to do stuff, we're, we're nowhere near any of that yeah. stuff. Just we're by close using... to black. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask one more question um, because we've been going at it for about an hour and I don't want to keep everybody here all day. So how how important was it that you work with a library as you guys were doing this and as we've sort of moved like how has the library been a partner and how has that been helpful in the open access process for you go ahead he keeps sending it to you <laughs> well a uh, yeah i mean I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> once yeah once he's your advisor he's always your advisor <laughs> yeah. right? uh, let's see how you answer yeah, this. exactly <laughs> yeah. um no i mean i think so when we started this uh the library was not even a part of the conversation uh you know so chris and i started the process in December of last year, right? Sort of had this idea at, at the All India Buffet one afternoon um, and, and <laughs> uh, lots of good work gets done there. And, and so I, would, I think we were, uh, you know, it, it was in draft. It was year, uh, two years ago, yeah, December, we had a right? Near, near, nearly a complete draft. Right, we had nearly a complete draft. Um, and then uh, we started talking about, so we sort of worked our way through what we wanted to do with respect to the copyrights and started talking about, well, where are we going to host it? Um, and then started this conversation with the library, and it was right about the time that Kilt Hub was sort of standing up, uh, at least from my point of view. It was like I'd never heard about it, and then all of a sudden it was a thing. Um, and when we looked at, at sort of talk, talk, went back to Dave Zombach, the head of civil and environmental engineering, and looked at where other books written by the civil engineering department were being hosted, said, you know, I think this is an opportunity for us to host it with the library. And l l sort of made an intentional decision to work through that process in the hopes that it would pave a way for other books that are written by uh, College of Engineering faculty to also host them there. So they would become a first choice. Again, because you can now, it's, now it's a durable location. I don't have to worry about the book. I know right where it is. Um, it's fine. I didn't have to deal with the, I don't even remember what the acronym DOI stands for, but I knew it was important. Um, and the library was able to, yeah, the library was able to. Same conversation, like, what is that? The library was able to take care of all of that. Um, and then, yeah. right. Um, and then even the, the uh, conversations with the OTL in terms of uh, talking to other referratories, uh, librarian to librarian as opposed to sort of me trying to manage a conversation in a space where I don't really have the expertise. So, uh, so I'm taking the project management book and doing an update, and I'll probably do it under Kilt Hub when that gets done. Same kind of reason? Yeah. Well, when we first started, it was literally just like, we want to make sure the CMU's library has, we did the same thing with the bookstore, we want to make sure the bookstore has a copy. Um, and it started there, just in, like every time something came out, I'd make sure I passed them a copy. And at some point in the process, somebody here said, oh, we looked at your website, you have digital copies, we could host them. We're like, oh, well, then I'd pass you the PDF, too. And, um, and as it's evolved, and the library's technology's evolved, 
Uh, it's become much more of a relationship in terms of the strategy of what we're doing and how we're going to do it. I'd say it's been, outside of the people, it's been a great working relationship. <laughs> <laughs> For Carolyn on Facebook and anyone else who uh, tuned in after the introductions were done, can you go back through and uh, tell who everyone is? And if you want to introduce yourselves, that would be great too. I can do that. Great. Um, actually, what I'm going to do instead of me, I'm going to have you all do it. I can do it again, but Drew, <laughs> tell the people who you are. Hi, I'm Drew Davidson. I'm the director of the Entertainment Technology Center and the founder of ETC Press. <laughs> I just was waiting to see if people you were going on from there. Yeah, they never. Short tweet. Yeah, they Short always. Tweet. Hi, uh, Don Caulfield, Associate Vice President for Facilities Management and Campus Services, and adjunct faculty in the Civil and Environmental Engineering. And one of the two authors of. Oh, yeah. And while we're advertising our book, one of the two authors <laughs> of, of Fundamentals of Infrastructure Management available uh, from your local Carnegie Mellon Library. <laughs> and I'm Chris Hendrickson. I'm a longstanding faculty member here at Carnegie Mellon University with appointments in civil and environmental engineering, engineering and public policy, and uh, Heinz School. I'm now emeritus and part time, mm -hmm. uh, and I still have a role as director of our Traffic 21 Institute. And I have four books up, The Fundamentals of Infrastructure Management, Project Management for Construction, Environmental Lifecycle Assessment, and Civil Systems Pricing and Investment. And I'm Brad King. I'm the director and editor of the ETC Press, working for that guy at the far left. Well, we're this far apart. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, stage left. Uh, are there any questions? Something from the internet crowd come on rick is pointing a finger and it looks like there's going to be a question i have a couple but i'll ask you one specific one since you changed over to an entirely digital infrastructure for making these discoverable you're working with the library offering a copy as group with it unlike a print book that you print it sits on a shelf what are your concerns for sustainability in terms of format or in terms of the digital object remaining viable a certain amount of time. That's almost a librarian question. I think there's people out here who have more expertise <laughs> That's than why I they do. work with a library. <laughs> so, so I just looked at my project management for construction book. I have it in three different forms. I have it in HTML, I have it in PDF, and I have it in an old format called .mss. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have it in Word. <laughs> Now, fortunately, you can take the PDF and convert it to Word without it much trouble. So you've got to rely on those sorts of conversions going forward to be able to work. And I can say at the ETZ Press, um, we have almost all of our books in press books, which separates content from design. So we have, it's, it's WordPress backend, right, that exports in nine different formats. So we have all the content existing as just HTML content that we can export in a variety of files. So depending on as things change and move, we can export them and put them in the new formats, and it takes, you know, a half hour. Although, like a like a longer term answer, because like, we've had some like someday there might not be press books or something, right. for instance. Like, well, yeah. Some of our earlier partners no longer are <laughs> existent. Um, and the same thing, you know, maybe someday a PDF is no longer a readable file, and so there's something we try to keep on. Not even that, just sometimes like. And they've improved their interface. Right. And nothing works yeah. anymore. Right. They take out a feature that you you were using all the time. Right. Things like that are have happened to us, and we adjust and pivot, and we try to just be open and honest about. Sometimes things will change that we have little to no yeah. control over. And we have every original file, so we have every word document, every individual. Like we have, we've sort of we're going through and organizing all of our backend files, so we have everything. So hopefully we can keep updating it. And there's only so much you can do, though, right? Like, there's only so much that you can prepare for. So have it each one laid out in Gutenberg press style. Where <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, so a follow-on question. Since you're looking at each of the elements as part of these publications, you were talking earlier about the additional affordances. So let's say an embedded um, VR segment, three-dimensional, orthogonal, or rotational interface or something, you have more elements you need to track going forward to refresh whatever that final right. document is, right? Give you the example, if you incorporated Flash before, well, <clears throat> that's a problem now. So is this, does this require more back. project right. management in terms of a textbook? Does this require a tighter interaction with editors who are technically savvy 
than you might have needed in more traditional presses? Well, I guess I have a preference for trying to avoid those sorts of problems. <laughs> so tr trying to do a fairly clean textbook without flash and think about anything fancy that's on the side. For example, our environmental life cycle assessment book has a whole bunch of affiliated spreadsheets and computational tools associated with it. And those going forward might be a problem to try and update. I mean, the, we've worked with, um, we have actually a small book coming out at the ETC Press at some point here about time-based media and the ways in which that's archived because that's a massive problem. Like, you've asked a problem that the government spent millions of dollars at the Library of Congress trying to figure out and they came up with this answer. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. So um, trying to figure out what those standards are going to be so that they can move forward like is a problem that everybody is trying to deal with right now because there's so many new emerging technologies that are built around interactivity and VR and things like that. How do you, how do you archive those? How do you archive them in a way that they're usable 20 years from now? And there's not really an answer. There's a lot of questions about how to do that. So the best we can do is be honest with our authors and say, the more you do cutting edge stuff, the more likely it is going to become a problem to archive it and use it 10 years from now. Yeah, and this isn't, I think, a problem that's specific to open access at all. And I know from working with the director of our bookstore, we have faculty who want, you know, calculus, for example, with the digital content, it's, it is on the side in that case, right? You get the book or you get the book plus the digital content and some want them together, some don't want the digital content at all. So, you know, these are problems I think that are challenging traditional well, publishers, publishers as well. I mean, I've seen stuff like the Olive Project here at Carnegie Mellon and the idea of like having everything emulated so that you can have this little capsule that it will run. Um, no matter what, uh, and uh, the stuff out at Stanford, you know, with Henry Lowood, like ways that you do these sort of digital archives. Like one of the things we struggled with is like imagine doing something like my master's thesis. I was trying to make the point that and a lot of us might support it. I was in the communication department. I was like, I wanted my academic scholarly research to be a performance. So it was going to be ephemeral and the only documentation was going to be the script and the video. And my committee said yes and the grad school said no. <laughs> they wouldn't let me graduate till I turned in a paper. Um, so what you meant with, with bringing in all of this, especially the issue of emulation, I, I think this is one of the issues that I'd heard some comments about this around the Library Press Coalition and the, uh, oh no, sorry, I forgot the, the other organization, American Association of University Presses, talking about the possible need for greater infrastructure from for-profit publishers especially. They're having the ability to develop this technology or develop standards and share the simulation technology, but the smaller, leaner <laughs> like ETC Press and others, or especially those who are more OA and operating in the black, but just to get content out there, that they might not have access to that kind of technology. Yeah. I mean, archive.org is doing some really interesting stuff now with interactive emulation, where you can like run old Mac or old Amiga stuff right there on the, in the website. But what's fall. interesting is that not everybody who makes things wants it to be emulated. Like this is part of the time-based media is that somebody says, look, I've made it in this format and when you emulate it, you've taken it out of that format and that's not the same and artists and people that make those won't allow that to happen, right? So there's lots of layers going on to like, this is what the digital archivists here have told me, is that it becomes sort of an individual working with the people that are making whatever this sort of interactive stuff is to work with them to say do you want this emulated in the future can we manipulate it so that it can be moved forward or is this just a thing that at some point will no longer be accessible and sometimes people make the decision that they have made the artifact and the thing that they've wanted to be the way that it is and when you can't view it anymore that's what happens. So I think some of that's going to be... And then there'll be text where you say, once upon a time. Right. <laughs> yeah, they'll just be like an X. Because books will last. Mm -hmm. They're well designed those books. That is a good way to end. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for coming out. Thank you guys for okay. uh, uh, talking. And um, thanks for the crowd speaking. Bye, Facebook. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>